I appreciate the chance to get to be with you again and talk to you about something that I think is on most, if not all, of our minds. This is June. June, for years now, has been designated Pride Month. And all this month, we are hearing a number of people saying, I am gay, I am lesbian, I am trans, I am proud to be that, thereby I declare it and I celebrate it. I used to join in that declaration. From 1978 to 1984, I was a committed gay activist, an openly gay man and a staff member with a gay affirming church. And during those years, I bragged, I'm proud, I'm gay, I'm out of the closet. Until in early 1984, God graciously interfered with my life, turned me around, and I'd say just about everything in my life changed except my big mouth. <laughs> Never got over that. So I'm still yakking away, and I'm still bragging. I still brag. But the object of my boast has changed now, whereas before I said, I who boast, boast in the fact I am gay, I take a cue from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9.23, in which the Lord said, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he knoweth and understandeth me, that I am the Lord. Now that is something worthy of boasting, to know him, to have by his grace been allowed to have your name written in his book of life, and to know that he is completing the good work that he began on you. Now that, I think, is worth shooting my mouth off about all year long, not just through June, but especially this month, I'd like to offer this as a counterpart to what we are so often hearing. For me, that work that turned me around began with an interruption. Now, I'll bet up to this point you don't relate to a lot of what I have said, and I'm glad you don't. Most people have not been tempted towards this particular sin. It is an abnormal feeling condition, orientation, whatever you wish to call it. So I wouldn't expect you to relate to that. But I would say we have this in common that we can all relate to. You and I got interrupted. That's why we're here. There was a time in our lives when we were literally dead. Jesus said, even if you are alive physically, you must be born again. Now, how did we get from there to here? We got interrupted. We were walking according to a certain way. Paul told the Ephesians, in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You were going that way, and then you got confronted with the gospel. <clears throat> Somebody did what God commissioned us to do. They shared the gospel. And the spirit of God softened your heart and convicted you to cause you to see your need based on whatever your particular sin was, however you fell short, you realized, ah, I need a Savior. And then he gave you the faith to receive Christ, to believe his promises, and he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That began with interruption, which is a heck of a concept, you know? I love the idea that God so relentlessly pursues and interrupts. We talk about Oh, Jehovah this or Jehovah that, and, and that's wonderful. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my, my peace. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. But I like to talk about Jehovah interrupt us. <laughs> the God who interrupts, because he does, doesn't he? You know? Now, isn't it interesting when he interrupts what he has to say? Because when God interrupts a woman's life, when God interrupts a man's life, generally it's not to say, hey, just wanted you to know everything you're doing is perfect. Keep up exactly what you're doing. 
maintain the status quo. God is never the God of the status quo, is he? When God interrupts our lives, what is he basically doing? He's saying, I have something better for you than what you have settled for. I call you into something deeper. I want to correct this part of your life. I want to strengthen this part of your life. I want you to keep following me and pursue me into something better than where you're at. That's interruption, see. Mine began <clears throat> when I was 16 years old. Now by that time, unfortunately, I was a mess. Um, I was consuming huge quantities of drugs, drinking excessively. And I was a very promiscuous homosexual. I had for years felt attractions towards the same sex. By the time I was 15, I was regularly taking a bus from Long Beach where I grew up out to Hollywood to hook up with adult men. And I was pursuing a number of things, one of them being acting. I fancied myself to be an actor. I, uh, I remember, oh, I think it was around my junior year in high school, getting into theater, and that sort of solidified my, my sense of being different, and it also, well, got me well acquainted with a number of people who were openly gay. Yeah, that really was me, 16 years old. Oh, I'm sure you remember that. That was my brilliant interpretation of Oscar Madison in The Odd Couple. You read my reviews. They were, they were really great. Broadway beckoned. Can't you just see? Good grief, that hair. <laughs> uh, But I still liked dating girls as well as guys. And that opened an amazing door when uh, one of my classmates asked me to a backwards dance. She was truly beautiful, one of our homecoming princesses, actually. And the backwards dances were where the girls would ask the guys instead of the guys asking the girls. So I went with her, had a great time, drove her home, said, hey, I'd love to see you again. And she said, well, good, I would love to see you too. I want to take you to my church. And I said, uh, your church, <laughs> great. I did not know really much uh, about church, but I, I was pretty sure that's where you went if you were very, very old or very, very ugly, one of the two. <laughs> and uh, here is this beautiful thing <laughs> asking me to church. So I was a little intrigued and said, okay, let's go. We drove from Long Beach out that Sunday to Costa Mesa to a little church called Calvary Chapel pastored by a man named Chuck Smith. Now, the place was bursting at the seams. I asked her what time service started. She said nine, but we have to get there by eight if you want to sit in a pew. Otherwise, you will have to sit on the floor. I didn't believe her. I did once we got there. Place was packed to the roof with newly born again hippies on fire for God. And to walk into Calvary Chapel in 1971 at the height of what we now call the Jesus Movement, as a non-believer, it was to get hit with a back truck. I mean, there was obviously something there. The fervency, the love, and although I couldn't physically verify it, I knew there is a presence here, there is something here that is compelling, and I want it, whatever it is. Well, I heard what it was when Chuck got up and started explaining the gospel. That was a key moment, because it was the first time I ever heard somebody plainly explain the claims of Jesus, who he said he was, the promises of Jesus, what he would offer, and yeah, the requirements of Jesus too. You want to follow me? You're going to deny yourself, take up your cross. And for about a month, I wrestled with an agonizing conviction as I wrestled with the question of, if I do follow him, am I willing to give up all that I have embraced? I have spent years getting used to the idea that I am gay. I have spent years wrestling with whether or not to give in to this. I have spent years developing some sort of pride in this particular part of me, and now I know if I come to Christ, that will be required of me. So what's it going to be? And finally, by the grace of God, it became very clear. Well, what, what does it profit you if you gain everything you want in this world and you lose your own soul? So uh, about a month after I first heard the gospel, I actually, in the middle of school, I didn't go forward at an altar call. 
I was always afraid if I went forward at an altar call, I would always wonder whether or not I did that because I was really moved by God or was I just swept away in all of the emotion of it. So I went by myself to the park across from my school, knelt in front of a tree and I said, Lord, I ask you to hear me now and receive me. I want to be born again. I accept your promises. And that was, of course, the moment when I was born again. And oh my gosh, those first days, you, you remember your early walk. I mean, it's a combination of new life and honeymoon and adventure and oh, wow. I remember just somewhat off topic, but oh my gosh, I, I was at the time involved with a man and I was born again on a Tuesday. On Thursday, I called him and said, we got to get together tomorrow night. I've got something to tell you. And we got in the car the next night and we drove somewhere and I said, just pull over, we'll talk right here. I'm not gonna go to a bar with you. I have to talk with you on the street. I have received Jesus and there really is a God and you know the third person of the Trinity is Jesus Christ who promised if any man wants to come after me, he will have to deny himself. But it's worth it because then you get to go to heaven and I don't want you to go to hell. Are you listening to me? And it was all just jumbling out and that was the first time I realized God speaks through us. God will, and I would stop in the middle of it and say, do you know what I think just happened? I think God was talking from me to you. And it, well, that's the kind of guy I became. Everywhere I went that first year, just yakety yak. I mean, anything that came near me, I would preach to. And if it walked away, I would hit it on the head and drag it back. <laughs> all zeal, dumb kid, but lots of zeal. And just devouring the word of God in church five, six nights a week, studying and worshiping and praying and loving the Lord. In fact, in May of 1971, I was baptized in Pirate's Cove and then began a time of realizing that there was something more I wanted. I loved God. I loved witnessing for him. I loved reading the word. I also loved speaking the word. And then I started to get more and more involved with an outreach of Calvary Chapel, which formed at that time in Long Beach. And that Bible study was growing to a few hundred kids and then several hundred kids, and it got bigger and bigger. And uh, eventually, within a couple of years, I was on staff with this ministry, which had become a rather charismatic ministry that involved evangelism and prayer for healing and outreach. And we had more than a thousand people coming a week. We had our own television show, our own radio show. We traveled, it exploded. That was a part of the general explosion that was happening at that time. And it was wonderful, truly wonderful in many ways. Now there is eternal fruit that came out of those years. Nobody can argue that. But for some of us, including me, there was a realization that we had gifts from God and we felt a calling from God on our lives. But some of us needed more refining before we stepped into ministry. Some of us needed to grow more emotionally before we stepped into ministry. Some of us needed a period of being built up because so often you may realize you have a passion for serving God, you have certain gifts that he has given you, but that alone doesn't mean it's ready for you to step into things full time. Now at that time, I must say our thinking was very apocalyptic. We thought the Lord was coming Tuesday before lunch. And I don't ever wanna lose that expectation, never. Because now more than ever, I believe it could be any second, I truly do. But in my youthful zeal, I thought if the Lord has coming soon, drop everything. Drop out of school. Don't work full time. Go into ministry full time and serve the Lord and, yeah, get married. Which I did foolishly at the age of 18. Not that there was anything wrong with getting married in and of itself. I truly loved the young woman that I married. We both loved the Lord. But unfortunately, our lives were very one-dimensional. We were fervent for the ministry, but that became our whole life. Not each other, not our family, not us. Well, we didn't have children, but not the unit that we were building. We saw everything as being focused on ministry, and that was where we found our identification and our value. Now, that is not a healthy way 
to approach ministry. Our ministry thrived. We served with that ministry for a number of years. But eventually, I, I became very disillusioned with the direction it went. Like many good works, this one went south, oh, in the late 70s, when it just got very commercial, it got too big, it got very hyped, very experience-oriented. We left, and I'm glad that we did. We should have. But all those years, I had had a dark little secret. I was a silent struggler. That is to say, when I was born again, I repented of homosexual sin. Absolutely, I stopped all of that. And I stopped the drugs, I stopped the drinking, I stopped the smoking. Every bit of licentiousness in my life was gone. But I still had temptations I didn't want to have. Now, at that time, I didn't realize that it was possible for a Christian to be full of the Holy Spirit but still have temptations. Somehow I thought that if I was really a new creature, I wouldn't have any dark temptations. Oh, maybe I would have a few. But they would be nice temptations, like Christian temptations, you know? Maybe I would do 68 on the freeway. Ooh. <laughs> maybe instead of listening to Maranatha music, I would turn on the Beach Boys for five minutes or something, you know? Christian sins, the nice kind. I didn't think anybody in the church could possibly wrestle with a sexual temptation, much less a homosexual one. And in my defense, let me say this. Man, in, in, in the early 1970s, nobody did what we're doing this morning. You didn't hear in church about a redemptive ministry to families who have loved ones who are LGBT. Nobody even talked about that. You never heard a testimony from a guy like me. Never. So I thought, well, I must be the only guy in the entire body of Christ who could have such temptations. The silent struggler is the Christian who has a secret. It could be, oh, an old emotional wound. It could be a sexual temptation that is out of the mainstream. It could be an addictive problem. It could be the survival of a molestation. Who knows? It could be something that causes the person to feel outside the mainstream. Now, most people who have experienced homosexuality also experienced the feeling of being outside the mainstream. I'm different. And the difference I have makes me a little weird to most people. So I'm over here, they are over there. Now, when such people come to Christ, they're born again. Hallelujah. But there are still problems in the soul that need to be worked out. And there is still the old nature that is at odds with the new nature. So Paul told the Galatians, the flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit wars against the flesh. That's life in this fallen world. Which makes us all the more fervent, all the more eager for that moment when this mortal will put on immortality and we will be translated and we will see him face to face. And there will come a time when we will never again know what it is like to have any thought or desire outside of the will of God. Wonderful thought. We will be free. We will be free. But in this life, there is some degree of struggle. Now, let's clarify the difference between struggle and transgression. A struggle is just that. I'm tempted to sin. I have to look away, change my thoughts, change the channel, whatever. That's a struggle. A transgression isn't a struggle. If I say, yes, I will look at the porn, I will flirt with a pretty girl, I will drink the whiskey, I will do whatever, that's not a struggle. That's a transgression. But for those who struggle silently, there is often a deep shame. If the people in this church knew what I wrestle with, they would never respect me. I felt that way. I finally got tired of the struggle, and I gave myself permission to start indulging. I started indulging in pornography privately, then finally started visiting gay bars, and then finally committed adultery. My wife found out. She rightfully asked for a separation. Within a year, she had divorced me. She had biblical grounds to do it. The shame was all on me, not on her. That's when I became out and proud. If you know someone who is out and proud, what you know is somebody who has said, I declare myself gay as a primary identifying factor. That is who I am. That's the difference between someone who says, well, I am a person 
who has homosexual feelings. The out and proud says, nope, I'm gay. And that is a part of my personhood. Does that mean that those people who are out and proud are enemies to the church? Well, no. No. Those of you who know and love someone who is out and proud, you realize in most cases they are just people, usually non-believers, who just want to live their lives and don't have any particular rigid agenda they're following. The problem is not that they're gay or lesbian or trans. The problem is they need to be saved. When people are dead in sin, their sexual activity or identity is just a symptom of that dead nature they have. <clears throat> Which is exactly why when Jesus encountered a Samaritan woman who was a woman in sexual sin, she was in fornication with a man she wasn't married to, she'd had a number of husbands before, he acknowledged that. <clears throat> he certainly didn't say it was okay, but he kept the main thing the main thing. He said, yes, I know you are involved with a man you're not married to. Now let me talk to you about who I am what I promise, what I want to offer you, because that is the real issue. So to the out and proud, what are we offering? The gospel. Not an argument about homosexuality. Now let's not back down if a lesbian, gay, or trans person says, what do you believe about my sexuality or about gender identity? What does the Bible say about this? Let's not back away. Let's never be ashamed of him or his words. But the main thing needs to be kept the main thing. We want people to come to him. And as part of their sanctification process, he frees them from the sin that has bound them. So what we are offering primarily is salvation, not just a plea for people to go straight. But I can only live out and proud for about a year because I was carousing around a lot. Not all gay men go out and carouse, but I did. And in my carousing around, why uh, I was finding myself more and more dissatisfied with the way I was living. I missed church, I missed prayer, I missed worship. I missed some of the aspects of Christian living, but I was not yet willing to submit myself completely to Christ. It's a place a lot of people are in. There are things about Christianity they liked. They like the company of other people and they like the music and they like some of the sacred activities that we do. But privately, a lot of people are going through those activities while still basically saying no to God on vital parts of their lives. I was one of those people. And so I felt that I had a choice to make, either Christ or gay. What's it going to be? Well, I was talking about this to a friend of mine in a gay bar I was sitting at one night, and he said, hey, Joe, you don't have to make a choice like that. There's a church in the area that will teach you how you can be openly gay and openly Christian. They have a new way of interpreting the Bible, and you will learn that God is okay with you being in a gay relationship. The authors of the Bible never really condemned that. We have misunderstood the Bible. Go check it out. Well, I did. That Sunday, I visited a gay-affirming church. This is what you might find interesting. When I walked into that congregation, when I walked into the sanctuary, I didn't know what I was going to find. But what I found, I didn't expect. First thing I noticed, the choir was singing a song. It was an anthem by the gospel writers Bill and Gloria Gaither called The King is Coming. I had sung that for years. The worship started, good night. Most of the songs were Calvary Chapel songs. And hymns that I had known, and people were lifting their hands while they worshiped, and I thought, my gosh, if it weren't for the fact that you know some of these people are uh, same-sex couples holding hands, I'd have never known I was at a gay church. It looks like an evangelical, mildly charismatic fellowship. Then the pastor got up and started preaching. That was the first time I heard the pro-gay interpretation of the Bible. If you have not yet been confronted with this, you will. There is a growing belief that the Bible has been misinterpreted and that it is really what they call gay-friendly, that God never really meant to condemn homosexuality. And there are people who will say, I've been born again. I have gifts of God. I worship in my church. My partner and I live responsible lives. And they will be saying to you, 
there is good fruit in my life, therefore I must be okay with God and this new interpretation of the Bible must be legitimate. When I heard that, that is when I became what I call religious, religious. I'm not going to say gay Christian because I don't like putting those two words together, but religious in the sense that I was observing many of the aspects of Christianity. I started reading my Bible again. I started praying again. I was in church again a few nights a week. Eventually, I even worked my way up the staff of the church and came on to pastoral ministry where I myself learned and started preaching the pro-gay interpretation of the scripture. What many are saying today is that perhaps this is an issue we can agree to disagree on. Because there are doctrinal issues that we can agree to disagree on. I mean, I know exactly where I stand on the rapture of the church. And as I've said a number of times, I'm ready anytime, thank you. But I'm not about to break fellowship with somebody just because they believe that the rapture of the church will come in a different time frame than I believe it's going to come. I think there are doctrinal issues that we could call secondary issues. Now, some people are trying today to say perhaps this is one of them. Churches that are gay-affirming can be in fellowship with churches that are not gay-affirming. This is just one of those doctrinal issues that that we don't have to really divide over and, you know, we can have people on our staff who are openly gay as long as they love the Lord and are living responsible lives. Can't we all just get along? I would argue that this is a primary issue, not a secondary one. Most of the New Testament books you will notice openly name and condemn sexual sin. That alone tells you that any sexual behavior, fornication, adultery, prostitution, or homosexuality, falling short of God's will is both a moral and a doctrinal issue. Let's also keep in mind the marital union in the Old Testament is a type of God's relationship to his people. In the New Testament, it is a type of Christ's relationship to his church. So no, those are sacred types that are not to be tampered with. In fact, the first case we have on record of church discipline occurred in the book of 1 Corinthians over a sexual issue. A member of the church was involved in sexual immorality and Paul blasted the church for tolerating that within the church. So no, this is not a secondary issue. This is a primary issue. Does that mean all of our friends and loved ones who say they are gay and Christian are forever lost? No, I don't believe that at all. I believe you can be Christian and can be wrong. And the fact that you are Christian does not make you right. But the fact that you are wrong does not necessarily mean you are damned. It means you're in a very serious danger, though. A Christian can be carnal, deceived, backslidden, lukewarm, prodigal. Those are all dangerous places to be. I would not want to be there again in my life. But I'm not about to say to our friends who say they are gay Christian or lesbian Christian, oh, no, you've never been born again, you've never known the Lord, What I would ask of them is what Paul asked the Romans. What saith the scripture? The fact that someone has at one time known Christ cannot legitimize what they are doing with their lives. So as always, what we would ask of those who are calling themselves gay Christians is, can you align your life with what the scripture teaches? Because if not, then you are outside of God's will, and that is a serious place to be. I was there for a number of years, but I found myself getting angrier and angrier those years I was serving on staff with the pro-gay church, because by then it was the early 1980s. Okay, by then I had settled myself. I'm a gay Christian. I had started a relationship with a man. We went to church together. We prayed together. We, We sometimes even did evangelism in gay bars together. I mean... I thought, I've got my act cleaned up. I'm a Christ-centered gay man. I'm happy with that. And I live in this bubble where everybody around me agrees with me. Well, by the early 1980s, oops, the church was starting to really speak up on this. Because by then, the gay rights movement had really come into ascendancy. And more and more Christian leaders were realizing we have to take a stand on this issue. Now, all of a sudden, when I turn on the TV, there's a preacher talking about this. Or when I turn on the radio, a a, a Christian spokesperson is being interviewed about this, and I am hearing what I have been trying to ignore, 
the book of Leviticus, the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, what Jesus said about marriage, things that I didn't want to think about, they were talking about. My conscience was testifying against me. The Holy Spirit was testifying against me. You've had those moments, I'm sure you have, where there's something in your life that he puts his finger on and says, you need to deal with this. Because Jesus said, well, every branch that abides in me, my Father purges so that it'll bring forth more fruit. This is part of our sanctification. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. Now, me, I love it when the Holy Spirit touches me, when the Holy Spirit bathes me. I love his presence. I'm not always crazy about his messaging. You know, sometimes he says things I'm really not interested in hearing. And sometimes I, I, I just say, oh, can't we just cuddle, you know? I like that. Can we skip this business? And No, we can't. Well, when that's testifying against you, you make a decision. I'm, a, I'm either going to obey or I'm going to try to silence it. I'll stomp it out. There, rah, silence. Okay, but if my conscience is bothering me and I'm stomping my conscience into silence, what am I going to do with you? If you are telling me what my conscience is trying to tell me, i got to silence you. No wonder there's so much intolerance in 2024. No wonder there's such a movement to silence the Christian voice on key social moral issues. Good night. You think if people are at peace with their decisions and their lives, they would freak out just because the church says, no, that's not what God intends? Of course not. At some level, something's bothering somebody. And so they make a decision just like I did, because that's when I became militant. I'm no longer just a gay man. I'm no longer just a gay Christian man. I'm militant. I march. I argue, I shout you down, I do interviews, I debate, I'm an activist. And there is something <laughs> wonderfully self-righteous about being that kind of guy. I would have made the most awesome Pharisee, I would have been good at that. Give me a bunch of rules and give me some self-righteousness and let me strut. Ooh, that, you know, it felt powerful. And I got to tell you, as a stupid kid, I did lots of drugs. LSD, methadrine, cocaine, benzedrine, hashish, opium. Nothing gave me a rush like self-righteous rage. Although, interestingly enough, I think there's something else going on here. With all of these different identity movements, these woke movements and all the rather violent aggression of these movements, I think, yeah, part of it is a wounded conscience. You know, you're telling me something I don't want to hear, shut up. But I think part of it also is people are suckers for a noble cause. I mean, people have a deep need to be a part of something noble. I understand that. Golly, when I was in high school and we studied the Holocaust and we studied about the European resistance, brave people who would shelter Jewish families at the risk of their own lives... I thought, wow, I'm jealous. How awesome you had an evil person to fight, innocent victims to defend, a noble cause to be a part of. What do you think young people are being told today on our campuses around the country? There are evil people to fight, people who hold conservative values. There are people who are innocent victims of these evil people. You can fill in the blanks, the lesbian community, the gay community, the trans community. There's a noble cause to fight. Fight the church to defend these people from the evil church. No wonder they get so angry. Now, this is also a time of extreme intellectual laziness. A lot of people don't even check out a cause before they jump on the bandwagon. And that's exactly where I was. Drunk on the power of gay activism until I got tired about it well, a couple of years later in early 1984. And this is why I say to anyone with a loved one caught up in this sin, anybody who knew Joe Dallas in those days had every right to give up on me. Logically, I guess they should have. But the Spirit of God is relentless in bringing the prodigal around. As he relentlessly was convicting me by early 1984 until finally I had to ask myself two hard questions. 
despite all my rhetoric, all my activism, all my bombast, was I really in the will of God? And if I wasn't, did I care? Because if I didn't care, what the heck had my life been about? That's why in early January 1984, I turned out all the lights in my apartment and knelt and prayed and said, Lord, I am finally ready after all this time to admit it. If I have been wrong, please show me. Which he did. The Spirit of God opening up my heart, the Bible in front of me, going through the scriptures again. I wept, I grieved, I wailed, I rejoiced, I was repentant, but I was also decimated looking at what I had done. Some of you will relate to this. If you've been involved in a life-dominating sin for years, when you finally are brought to repentance, you not only deal with the sin in your own life, you have to deal with the impact it's had on other people. I had to deal with what I had done to a woman who I had betrayed, to the people I had ministered to who I had betrayed, the people I had deceived, the people I had encouraged to go into sin. I had to deal with all of that and more, and to be candid, still dealing with it to a point even all these years later. I relocated got myself into a Bible-believing church, that's when I became repentant, repentant. Now, the repentant is the one who says, yes, I've come to realize LGBTQ, it's not what God intended. I repent of it. I come to the church and I ask you, Christian people, what do I do now? That's basically what I asked the church. Christian men took me in, said, yeah, be a part of our life. Join our softball team. Come to the men's study. Join the choir. Love to have you be a part of our lives. I said, that's nice, guys, but you need to know where I've been. And you need to know that although I've repented of that sin, there are times I still have those feelings. And if you are grossed out, I don't blame you. I'm disgusted with what I've done with my life. And I'm sorry to tell you that I am still wrestling with both the terrible memories of what I've done and the temptations I at times have. And if you want to show me the door, I don't blame you. Funny looking at them when I said that. They had this bored, almost amused look. And one of them said, well, Joe, let let, let me be sure we've got this right. Um, You are a Christian who sometimes has temptations. Hmm. And sometimes you have thoughts you wish you didn't have. And there are things you have done in your life that you regret. He said, gee, that's... That's remarkable. Someday you've got to tell us what that's like. It was the best thing they could have said. (laughs) Because they said, look, don't you realize that's every believer's story? Maybe not as radically as yours, but all of us have done things we regret. All of us have temptations we wish we didn't have. All of us have things go through our heads that are not godly. And they said, look, guy, we don't relate to your struggle." but we relate to struggle. So we're not going to ask of you anything we don't ask of ourselves. Get into the Word daily. Develop your prayer life. Be in fellowship. Get close to us. Let us get close to you. Be honest with us about your struggles. We'll be honest with you about ours. And let's build each other up, iron sharpening iron, and let's become the men of God we're meant to be. There. I mean, hint, hint, a lot of people say, now how do you minister to people who are caught up in that? That's how, it's not rocket science, is it? It's discipleship. In fact, side issue, but let me say this plainly. All of the healing and sanctification and correction LGBTQ people need exist within the body of Christ, if the body of Christ only knew it. For so long we have told them, go find a psychiatrist, go get the demon cast out of you, Go to some parachurch organization where they'll do something fancy. Now, I run a parachurch ministry. Obviously, I believe in them. But parachurch ministries are the supplement. We are the protein powder, the vitamin B12. The main meal is in the local church. You don't ever substitute the main meal for the supplements. You take the supplements to supplement the main meal, not instead of the main meal. 
And I must tell you, the most extraordinary sanctifying changes that happened in my life happened because of my relationships within the body of Christ. I had a great Christian counselor, and I read some good books. Those were good supplements, but the meal, it's in the church. It's right here in our capacity to love each other and to serve each other. And in the context of living my life out in that environment, yeah, what I thought was unthinkable happened. I had contacted my ex-wife when I repented. She had remarried. She had moved on. Fine. I respected that. I thought I would live the rest of my life a celibate man. Why not? I never even asked God to change me, but I found changes happening. The temptations came less frequently. When they came, they came less intensely. I met a young woman in the choir there who I liked. Then I realized I don't just like her, I admire her. Then I realized I don't just like and admire her, I want her, I desire her. Finally worked up the nerve to ask her out after about six months. (laughs) Because I realized uh, with my resume, I'm not exactly what most Christian women are looking for, you know. And I told her my story. We dated for about a year and a half. I proposed a... uh, at that time, and then we were engaged another year and a half. In August of 1987, we were married, and she became not only my wife, but the mother of my two sons and a vital part of my ministry work as well. And since then, I've had the honor, really the honor, in my own ministry since 1987, offering biblical counseling to men and women who have been caught up in the same sin I was caught up in and walking alongside them. Which really brings us to an important point. Back in the late 1960s, Pastor Chuck Smith and his wife Kay would drive up and down Pacific Coast Highway looking at hippies. And Kay would start crying, and they would pull over to the side of the road and pray, Lord, they are so lost. These kids are so lost. Bring them in. Well, you know what followed. Here we are in 2024. What are we witnessing if not a country in hospice care? The corruption, it seems terminal. It seems hopeless. It's very discouraging. More than ever, of course, we need clarity from the church on what God intended and what he didn't. More than ever, we need to not back down on speaking the truth about human sexuality and the definition of marriage and what God meant when he made us male and female. More than ever, we need clarity on that. But more than ever, we also need the compassion of Chuck and Gay who are looking at these people, kids mutilating their bodies, people trying to morph marriage into whatever they want it to be, homosexual or polygamous or who knows what, you know, confusion and deception. And we can be astonished, we can be appalled, but oh, how we need the heart that God gave Chuck and Kay when they would pull over and say, Lord, they are so lost. Bring them to us. And I am convinced, sure as I'm looking at you, that not only have they been quietly coming in, But as this all escalates, more and more of them are going to reconsider what they're doing, and they're going to come in with a roar, not to protest, not to make trouble, but to say what I said in 1984. What do I do now? I was so encouraged about 30 years ago reading an article by an Episcopal bishop who was writing about the struggles the church was facing in learning how to maintain our teachings on marriage and sexuality without seeming irrelevant to the culture. And he said, let me quote you this, one of the most attractive features of the early Christian communities was their radical sexual ethic and their deep commitment to family values. These things drew many people to them who were disillusioned by the promiscuous excesses of what proved to be a declining culture. Wouldn't it be wonderful for our church to find such countercultural courage today? My goodness, how long do you think all of this madness can last before people start realizing it's futile, it's not giving me what I thought it was going to give me? Now what? And when they reach that point, they'll do exactly what this bishop said 
members of the early church did in those days. They'll start looking to the attractive alternative. And that is where the body of Christ comes in, a redemptive response to a terrible situation. Because what was true from the beginning is true right now. Where sin did abound, grace much more abounds.